morning. I invite you to turn to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. As Carol and I approach a pivotal transition in our life, this passage has become more and more dear to me. Proverbs chapter 2, and we'll be looking this morning at verses 1 through 8. Before we moved here, we lived in New Mexico, and while we were in New Mexico, I I, I learned about a person, his name is Forrest Finn, who lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He was a millionaire and had traveled the world over. One day, he decided in 2010 that he would take a box, a treasure chest, fill it with gold, emeralds, rubies, jewels, all kinds of expensive artifacts that he had collected as he traveled the world. And he took that treasure chest and he went into the Rocky Mountains by himself and buried the treasure chest. And while the location remained undisclosed, he penned a 24-line poem to give would-be treasure hunters clues to where the treasure chest is. And so this is his poem. Listen to the poem. He says, As I have gone alone in there, and with my treasures bold, I can keep my secret where, and hint of riches new and old. Begin it where the warm waters halt, and take it in the canyon down, Not far, but too far to walk. Put in below the home of Brown. From there, it's no place for the meek. The end is ever drawing nigh. There'll be no paddle up your creek, just heavy loads and water high. If you've been wise and found the blaze, look quickly down, your quest to cease. But tarry scant with marvel gaze, just take the chest and go in peace. So why is it that I must go and leave my trove for all to seek? The answer I already know, I've done it tired and now I'm weak. So hear me all and listen good, your effort will be worth the cold. If you are brave and in the wood, I give you title to the gold. One article said that upwards of 350,000 people searched for Fenn's treasure. Five people actually died looking for it. In an article, he said, No one knows where the treasure chest is but me, and if I die tomorrow, the knowledge of that location goes in the coffin with me. The treasure may be found tomorrow, or it may be found a thousand years from now. But in the meantime, what Fenn requested his listeners to do was study topographical maps and marry the maps to what he's written in his poem to lead them to the treasure. Now, people love a good treasure hunt. Books have been written about treasure hunts. Movies have been made about treasure hunts. Can the clues be aligned? Can the map be followed? Can the treasure be found? Well, that brings us to Proverbs chapter 2 this morning. Proverbs chapter 2 urges us to go on a treasure hunt. However, instead of giving obscure clues, it gives us very clear guidance and actually guarantees that the treasure will be found. The Proverbs were written by Solomon, David's son, who was endowed by God with very extraordinary wisdom. Now, even the book, Proverbs, belongs to a certain genre of Scripture known as wisdom literature because of the wisdom that it contains. It uses the word wisdom upwards of 40 times, and if it doesn't use the word wisdom, it'll use words like knowledge, understanding, discernment, similar terms like that. But the book isn't simply about wisdom, but it's about how we attain that wisdom. And particularly this passage, the book 
as a whole, Proverbs, urges us to seek wisdom, but Proverbs chapter 2 in these first eight verses urges us in a very particular manner. And not only does the passage show us how to seek it, but it gives us the marvelous promise that if we seek it, we'll find it. Listen as I read Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. It says, My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. If you cry for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice. And he preserves the way of his godly ones. Now Solomon very clearly here is urging his son to persistently search for wisdom. And if his son will do that, he will find his wisdom. Now, this is a call not only to the author that Solomon's, or the, the audience that Solomon's writing to in the context, his son, but this is a call to you. It's a call to me to earnestly seek God's wisdom. And if we earnestly seek God's wisdom, he will give us his wisdom. So, how do we search for God's wisdom? And how do we know that if we search for it rightly, we'll find it? Well, I think our text this morning lays out three aspects of wisdom that show us not only how to search for it, but the guarantee that we'll find it. Three aspects of wisdom, particularly its conditions, its promise, and its giver. The conditions of wisdom, verses 1 through 4, the promise of wisdom in verse 5, and the giver of wisdom in verses 6 through 8. So let's start by looking at the conditions for wisdom. Now, I've titled this first point conditions because you can see as you look at verses 1 through 4, you see all these ifs. If you do this, and if you do that, if you meet these requirements, these are the conditions, Solomon says, if you're going to seek wisdom the way wisdom is intended to be sought. And I love how he begins verse 1. He says, my son. Now, it was common for kings in Solomon's day to pass on wisdom to their children. And archaeologists have actually found numerous documents of kings passing down words of wisdom to their sons. And it had to do with wise speech and wise conduct, wise living. But obviously, Solomon is extremely unique. What we have with Solomon are not just his thoughts written down on the page, but he's actually inspired by God with these words. He is the author of part of Scripture, which is inspired by God. And it would be different if it was started out to whom it may concern. You know, there's there's a personal aspect to what Solomon's writing here. He doesn't just say, whoever might be reading this. He uses the term of endearment, my son, And I think it's not just intended for his son, maybe Rehoboam or whoever, but he's writing to all of us who would listen to his words. He's, In a sense, he's trying to draw us in and say, listen to what I'm about to tell you. My son, listen to my words. He's taking us, if you will, under his wing, and he wants to mentor us and guide us and lead us in the way of wisdom. Now, the conditions of wisdom, I mean, they're all laid out here in verses 1 through 4, but if you could list it under one sort of umbrella term, the primary condition for wisdom is action. Action. It takes action, and it takes effort, and it takes full engagement on your part and on my part. Specifically, he calls for eight actions, and there's four verses, and there's a pair of actions in each verse. So there's eight of them total. He begins in verse 1 by stating simply, receive wisdom. 
My son, if you will receive my words. This is very simple. This is a simple action plan here. Receive it. It's as if it's there for the taking. You just have to reach out and receive it. And you notice that it's conveyed in words. The words have been captured and written, and all we have to do is receive these words. It's really that easy. And as you read through the Proverbs, you come to learn that it really is that easy. I mean, if you go back and you read Proverbs 8, Proverbs 9, you'll see wisdom is personified as this woman who's standing at the busy intersections where all the people are passing by and she's just calling out, asking for someone to listen to her, to receive what she's giving. It's there. Receive it. It's that easy. Proverbs 4, 7 says, The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And in all you're acquiring, gain understanding. Receive wisdom. That's the first condition. And secondly, treasure it. He says, if you'll receive my words and treasure my commandments within you. After being received, you and I must treasure wisdom. Treasure it, hoard it up, store it up, and protect it. That's what it means to treasure something. You guard it, and you prevent anybody from getting access to it, lest they rob you of it. I think of Job, who said in Job 23, 12, I've, depart- I've not departed from the command of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I've treasured the word of God more than my necessary food. Think about that. The next time you need food. Reminds me of what Jesus said. Man does not live on bread alone. Echoing Deuteronomy. Psalm 119.11, very familiar verse. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've treasured it. I've guarded it. Because it's more precious than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, even the drippings of the honeycomb. David said in Psalm 19.10. Receive it, treasure it. Thirdly, listen to it. He says in verse 2, make your ear attentive to wisdom. Literally, perk up your ears. This describes the rising of the ears. It's It's a description of an animal who hears a noise like a dog You've probably seen a dog that hears a strange noise and it perks up its ears and directs its ears toward where that noise is coming from and it's canceling out any other noise so it can give all of its listening power to what that noise is. That's what's being described here. Incline your ear. Give your ears full attention to these words, to this wisdom. Eliminate all other distractions and listen carefully. This is the very rare and difficult skill of active listening and listening carefully. Receive it, treasure it, listen to it. He says at the end of verse 2, incline your heart to it. Give not only your ears to it, but give your heart to seeking wisdom. Literally, turn into it. Stretch out for it. Open wide to grab it and receive it. If you're going to find wisdom, it's going to involve your entire being. Not just your ears, but the entirety of your heart. Searching for it. Seeking it. Longing for it. Fifthly, he says in verse 3, you should ask for it. Ask for wisdom. Cry for it, he says. If you will just cry out for discernment, he says in verse 3. Now the phrase cry out, that's used multiple times throughout the Old Testament of people who simply call on God. And particularly this phrase cry out is found most in the book of Psalms. And particularly the Psalms of Lament, where the psalmist is in such dire circumstances doesn't know which way to turn or where to go, and so the psalmist cries out to God. 
asking for guidance, asking for wisdom, asking for direction. There's a sense of desperation here in verse 3, crying out for discernment. Now, certainly, we should not wait until those times of desperation to cry out to God, but how often do we find ourselves in those circumstances? Desperate, uncertain, unclear on which way to go. Cry out for discernment. And he, even, he, he intensifies it in the second half of verse 3. Not only asking for wisdom, but pleading for wisdom. Lift your voice for understanding. It's hard to tell in the English, but lift your voice for understanding is actually a stronger statement than crying out for discernment. It's as if Solomon is a coach and you're crying out, but you're not crying out loud enough, and so he's urging you to cry louder, cry longer. Give your crying and your pleading all that you've got. Give your full ability of crying out, prayer, to finding and seeking wisdom. This will be the measure of how, you, how genuinely you desire wisdom. Just how desperate are you? How much do you cry out for wisdom? To what lengths will you go in seeking it and desiring to find it? Do you pray once and then abandon the effort? Or do you pray and ask and seek and knock And if it doesn't come, do you pray more and ask more and seek harder and knock louder? Plead for wisdom. And then the last two in verse 4, the last two conditions, he says, if you will seek her for silver. Notice that Solomon begins with the lesser quality of metal here. And he starts this way because he's going to intensify it in the second half of the verse Seek her for silver. The verb seeking describes effort, energy, giving yourself to it. And you seek it because you desire it. You want it. You're after it. You seek in order to find it. There's a demand in you that causes you to seek harder and harder. And lastly, the last condition in the end of verse 4, search for her as for hidden treasures. And I just think about that. Who wouldn't want the wealth of treasure and silver? I mean, who wouldn't want to find Forrest Fenn's treasure chest? How much time and effort have people given to studying that poem and studying maps and spending time out in the woods looking for a box of metal? How much more should you and I seek God's wisdom, searching for it? And if we seek it and we don't find it, we search harder. The treasure is hidden, which is what he's describing here, which implies it demands our seeking, our searching. Now, I have to say at this point, before we move on to the promise of wisdom, if you're here and you're not a Christian... God's wisdom is not available to you as it is to a believer. Your first step toward wisdom is recognizing how offensive your folly is to God. How foolish you are. And if you're here and you're not a believer, you need to turn to God. Confessing your sin and your folly and seeking Him for forgiveness. Jesus, the ultimate wise man, offered Himself for fools like you and fools like me, that we might gain the wisdom of God. Paul said it to the Corinthians this way, by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. Well, the primary condition for wisdom is action, receiving it, treasuring it, listening to it, giving your heart to it, crying for it, pleading for it, seeking it, searching it. 
And guess what? If you will do this, there's a wonderful promise, the promise of wisdom. It's found in verse 5. Notice what he says. Verses 1 through 4, if you will do this, if you will do this, if you will do that, verse 5, then you will. Notice the guarantee of that statement there. You will. It's not a question of if you will. It's a guarantee. You will. Notice what he says. You will discern. In other words, your search for wisdom will have a change in your understanding. It will result in a change in your ability to mentally separate and distinguish things. Your search for wisdom will impact your mental faculties. You'll have a new way of discerning and understanding. And specifically, he says here, you will discern the fear of the Lord. That's interesting. You would think as you work through verses 1 through 4, you'd get to verse 5, and he would say, then you will find wisdom. But he says, you will discern the fear of the Lord. Now, this is important because the fear of the Lord appears 14 times throughout the book of Proverbs. And what you learn is the fear of the Lord is absolutely critical to wisdom. Fear doesn't necessarily mean to be scared, but the word fear here describes reverence or revering, respecting, honoring the Lord. The first time the phrase appears in Proverbs is back in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, that says, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that usage at the very beginning of Proverbs implies that this is a prerequisite. If you are going to search for wisdom, this is where wisdom begins. The fear of the Lord. All of the other Proverbs rise or fall on the fear of the Lord. And you and I are called to fear the Lord. He demands our fear. And fearing the Lord is a product of our understanding who He is. All of His attributes, His character, His promises, everything He's revealed to us about Himself in the Word of God demands a response from us, and that response is to be fear. Because of His attributes, His works, His name, His righteousness. Look over at Proverbs 9, verse 10. This is another very familiar proverb. Again, the prerequisite for wisdom. Very similar to Proverbs 1.7, Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Notice how foundational this statement is. The fear of the Lord is the root of all wisdom. It's the beginning. It's the commencement. It's the initial steps into wisdom. Wisdom. Fear of the Lord is essentially the gate that you have to go through before you'll ever have access to God's wisdom. Now, what I love about Proverbs, if you look at Proverbs chapter 3, talking about this subject of the fear of the Lord. Now, the Proverbs, in a lot of ways, can be pulled out of their context. They're phrases that stand alone on themselves. One of those is Proverbs chapter 3, verses five and six, that I would imagine most of us, if not all of us, know this promise, Proverbs five and six. But what people fail to realize with these two verses is that if you only quote or cling to verses five and six, you're guilty of pulling it out of its context. Because verse seven is woven into the fabric of the promise of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. We love that promise, don't we? But you can't disconnect it from verse 7. Verse 7 is tied to it. 
And you know that because he begins, do not be wise in your own eyes, which is a repetition of what he said in verse 5. Don't lean on your own understanding. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Friends, if you are clinging to the promise of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, make it 3, 5, 6, and 7. Because the fear of the Lord is absolutely critical to God's wisdom and you attaining that wisdom. Now, aside from all the promises, if you look back at Proverbs chapter 1, there's also warnings throughout the Proverbs. And you find the first warning in Proverbs in chapter 1, starting in verse 24. You remember, as I said, Proverbs describes wisdom as a a woman who's in the streets calling out for anybody to just listen, stop, and give their ear to what she's crying out. There's a warning in chapter 1 against those who refuse to listen. Look at verse 24. She says, Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention, and you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes, when your dread comes like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then you will call on me, but I will not answer. Then you will seek me diligently, but you will not find me. Why? Verse 29. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. You see how critical the fear of the Lord is to gaining God's wisdom? It's absolutely critical. There is so much blessedness that comes with the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 10.27 says, The fear of the Lord prolongs life. 14.26 says, In the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence. 14.27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. 15.16, better is the fear of the Lord than great treasure. 16.6, by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. 19.23, the fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. 22.4, the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. I mean, it's like, raise your hand if you'd like to have riches and honor and life, prolonged life, strong confidence, the ability to keep away from evil. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Now, there's a second promise back to chapter 2, verse 5. Not only in our search for wisdom will we discern the fear of the Lord, But he says, we'll also discover the knowledge of God. You will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Notice how these two sort of flow out of one another. I love love verse 5. It's like a buy one, get one free deal in verse 5. Now, the knowledge of God. What does Solomon mean when he says the knowledge of God? I think it could be one of two different things. The knowledge of God could mean that as you seek wisdom, you'll gain more knowledge of who God is. Or on the other hand, if you search for wisdom, you'll actually gain the knowledge of God. The very knowledge that God has, you will gain. Now, with regard to the first meaning, I think when we discern the fear of the Lord, I think it opens us up to a deeper understanding of who God is, causes us to go deeper in our knowledge of who He is. His Word reveals to us who He is, and it enables us to know and comprehend Him more. That's true wisdom. I mean, you remember the words of the Lord in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That is true wisdom. 
the knowledge of God. But on the other hand, I think both of these are true. Not only do we deepen our knowledge of who God is, but I think as we truly seek God's wisdom through His Word, we begin to think like God. And we begin to know the things that God knows because He's revealed them to us through His Word. Our thoughts will be shaped by God's Word, enabling us to acquire His very own knowledge, the knowledge of God Himself. In this way, we gain the knowledge of God, and in gaining the knowledge of God, we gain the very knowledge He possesses. Profound. But again, before we move to the next point, I have to say, if you're not a believer... God's wisdom is fenced off from you. You can seek God's wisdom, but there's something you need to deal with first. You're not going to be able to discern the fear of the Lord or gain the knowledge of God. Why? Because the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God first comes by possessing eternal life. I think Jesus said that in John 17, 3. This is eternal life. In other words, here's the definition, if you will, of eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord begins with you turning from your sin and turning to Christ. Only then will God's wisdom be accessible to you. Those of us who are believers... We should seek God's wisdom. And we should seek God's wisdom knowing, knowing that we will find it. He promises that we'll find it. And how can we be so assured that His promise is true? Because He is the giver of wisdom. This is the third aspect of wisdom that Solomon gives us here. The giver of wisdom, verses 6 through 8. I love this description of the Lord. Solomon says, hey, if you will seek and search and listen and plead for and treasure, you will find wisdom. Why? Verse 6, because the Lord gives wisdom. When we seek wisdom, we can find it because the Lord gives it. He is the source of all true wisdom. The only true wisdom in all of creation comes from Him. People seek wisdom in psychology, philosophy, self-help, false religion, but the only true source of wisdom is the Lord. No other true wisdom in this world exists outside of the wisdom that the Lord gives. Now, if if anybody knew this, Solomon knew this. When you go back and you read 1 Kings 3, when God appears to Solomon and says, hey, ask me for whatever you want. I mean, think about that, a blank check, God, asking you, whatever you want. What does Solomon ask for? He asks for wisdom. He asks for wisdom. If anybody knows that it's the Lord who gives wisdom, it's Solomon. And he's passing that promise on to us. Notice again that this wisdom is contained in words. You see that in verse 6, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. The Lord gives wisdom, and His wisdom is contained in words. In other words, the Lord gives wisdom, and He gives it through His inspired, inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word. He's given us His Word. He's given us His wisdom, and it's contained in His words. These words come from His mouth. Look at verse 7, though. Not only does he give wisdom, verse 7 tells us he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. Literally, God gathers wisdom, stockpiles it, and has a surplus of it, ready to disperse it, ready to give it out, ready to give it to those who are genuinely seeking. Wonderful promise. He has plenty of it, and he's always standing by, ready to to bestow it. 
to those who search for it. And he goes on, he's a shield to those who walk in integrity. God shields those who search for wisdom. These phrases, the upright, those who walk in integrity, his godly ones, these all describe genuine seekers of God's wisdom. He shields them. Verse 8, he guards them. He guards the paths of justice. And if there's one thing you learn about wisdom throughout the Proverbs, that justice, equity, fairness are all characteristics of God's wisdom. And it'll be manifested in us. And God will guard our steps, guard our way. And then I love the very end here, the end of verse 8. He preserves the way of his godly ones. This giver of wisdom preserves the way of his godly ones. As I was meditating on this last phrase, I couldn't help but think about the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. If you're familiar with that, the the acrostic tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. You know, a lot of people don't prefer that phrase, perseverance of the saints, and would rather describe it as perseverance or perseverance of the saints, but preservation of the saints. Because unless God preserves, you and I will not be able to persevere. Here we have the promise, he preserves his saints. He preserves the way of his godly ones. There's nowhere else for us to turn for wisdom. God, through his word, has given us the wisdom we need. This is why we must be skilled with the word of God. If there's one book that we master in this life, it should be this book, where God's wisdom is contained. I mean, this passage is loaded with promises, promises to those who seek God's wisdom. We're urged to seek God's wisdom. And in the seeking, God promises that we'll find. So the question for us is, are we willing to put in the effort? Are we willing to put in the action that's necessary to find God's wisdom? Do we realize that it's contained here? And do we seek it and search for it? I mean, you can answer that on your own by how much time you spend in God's word, seeking it, searching it. I mean, do we wait until we're in trial and difficulties before we seek it and search it? The reality is we need God's wisdom daily. Not just when we're confused and in trying circumstances, but we need it every day when we're desperate spiritually and when we're prospering spiritually. So praise God for him giving us his word and his spirit. Praise God for giving us his son, Colossians 2.3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Praise God that we can pray to him and request like Joe read in James 1.5. My brethren, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to you. So by God's grace, may our lives be marked by a diligent effort to seek his wisdom. Let's pray. Father, we confess that you are the only wise God, that you are the one who stores up sound wisdom. Lord, we confess to you our folly, how often we're foolish, Lord, grant us wisdom. Grant us a heart that desires and seeks it and searches it as for hidden treasures. And Lord, may we find it according to your promise. We trust you and we look to you, the giver of all wisdom. In Christ's name, amen.